you're listening to the Talkative Toastmaster podcast. I'm your host, Melanie Surplus. In this podcast, we explore how Toastmasters can help you to polish your public speaking skills, communicate with confidence, and amplify your authenticity. You'll hear from my fellow Toastmasters and I how this global organization has impacted our lives for the better and how it could impact yours. Now, let's get talkative. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to episode 45. This week, my guest, Umi Hussain, is calling in from Montreal, Canada. Umi has been in and out of Toastmasters since 2015 and has held club leadership positions such as President and Vice President Education. She's currently a member of the Words of Wings Toastmasters Club. And she says that Toastmasters has helped her tremendously with her YouTube channel, being a panel speaker for several events, giving workshops for nonprofit organizations, and doing many podcast interviews. She reached out to me via social media after finding my podcast, and I'm delighted to be speaking with her about her Toastmasters journey. Ermi, welcome to the show. Hi. Great to have you here. Can you start by telling us, Ermi, why you joined Toastmasters in the first place? Yes. So if we go back to 2015, this was uh, the period where I was still in university and I joined the Toastmasters because basically I needed some extracurriculum activities. And what happened is I actually attended a workshop while I was still in university where they were talking about Toastmasters. And I was like, you know what? I have to work on my public speaking skills. Let me just go and see what this Toastmaster is all about. So I joined a club in 2015, the one from my university. And I was part of it for like eight months. And I didn't stay longer because afterwards I had to graduate. But back then I wasn't doing as much uh, work as I was supposed to. Like I was just going there for the sake of like having (laughs) something on my resume. And I did like a few speeches, but I feel like I was never, never getting anything out of it. And then what happened in 2019, this is when I was like, I'm going to be serious about this. And what happened is I I watched a speech from uh, Meghan Markle and where she was basically talking about like women's education. And then I I used to watch a lot of TED Talks and I still do watch a lot of TED Talks. Mm. And so what happened is I went to this other Toastmaster club called Royal Speakeasy, which is based in Montreal. I went to their first meeting and I told them that I'm here because I want to deliver a TED Talk eventually. So that was my uh, main reasoning for joining Toastmasters. I uh, began my journey, my actual journey in 2019. I was Mm. part of this club for five years. I took on several roles. I took the role of president. I took the role of VP of education. And now I recently changed to a new Toastmasters club because the previous one wasn't quite working with my schedule. Mm. And now I joined the white wow club and it's been uh, I think three weeks that I'm part of this club and I'm I'm very much enjoying it a lot. Mm. And it's interesting you talk about how you decided to actually make the commitment to get engaged you know the first little stint you weren't really committed but then the second stint okay right and then you did five years at it. Did you find the consistency of going and, and really getting stuck into it started to make a difference in your public speaking skills? Yeah, I would definitely say the biggest difference or the biggest impact that I had in my uh, personal growth was when I took the leadership roles in Toastmasters. It was literally when basically what happened is there was a VP of education, like there was a role of the VP of education, but the actual VP of education back uh, had to drop on the role, had to basically, he was not able to commit. And then they mm. come, came up to me, they're like, oh, do you want to be the VP of education? <laughs> yeah. And this is when I feel like I started to see the real change in me. Like I, I took every single meeting very seriously. I took on my role as VP of education very, very seriously. And Mm. that's when I started to see that, you know, I was becoming much more confident. I was much more comfortable uh, talking in front of people. I was still very nervous, but at the same time, I told myself that if I don't do this, I'll never conquer the fear. I was very committed. I'm still very committed. And I always go back to my why, which is I want to give a TED talk. And I see how Toastmaster has really helped me in other aspects of my life. Like I, you know, open a YouTube channel. I 
get interviewed in various podcasts. I go to job interviews and I'm okay to answer, you know, those impromptu questions that we learn <laughs> from the table topic session. So mm. I have learned really a lot of uh, good things from it. I'm looking forward to hearing more about the YouTube channel in a minute, but um, what do you most enjoy about being a member now? You know what? It's a sense of community. Uh, that we get from Toastmasters. I think every Toastmaster club that you participate, the longer you stay, uh, the more it feels like you belong to something. And I do feel like, especially in my, my previous Toastmaster club, the Royal Speakeasy Club, where I've been there for about five years, I mm. do consider them as my family, like my second family, because I feel like the group is supporting, is encouraging. They want you to succeed. Mm. You know, they help you with your growth. And I feel like every single club does the same thing. I also spoke with another member from a different club and she told me the same thing. She's like, every club feels like it's it's like sort of like your family because everyone is there for, with the same goal. Everyone is there to cheer you. Everyone wants you to, to see that you are you know, conquering the fear, being able to speak confidently. So I, I do very much enjoy the sense of community that I get from Toastmasters. Definitely. And I agree. I think that is very much a global experience and each club is slightly different. But yes, once you've been there a couple of years and you sort of grow with the members and you get to hear all manner of bits and pieces about their life that they probably don't share outside of the clubs in some instances. It's quite personal what people share in their speeches and the vulnerability. And I guess that's a place for practicing vulnerability and and just gauging people's reactions to the stories that you tell um mm-hmm. have, have you found that in your clubs yeah yeah definitely i i do feel like you get to learn so much from other people and the most beautiful thing is that you get to meet people that you wouldn't meet normally like these are even people that you would hang out on like like these are <laughs> not like your circle of friends these are people that come from different parts of their life, from different, you know, industries. And it's nice that we all come together with this same goal. And it's nice to see also their journey, how much they have grown, you know, how much they have become better speaker. And it's nice to hear their stories because, you know, from the icebreaker that everyone gets to do, you you <laughs> get to learn a little bit about who they are, why they are there, what is their their story, what is their why. And that's that's really nice to see in every Toastmasters club. In terms of your why, you mentioned wanting to do a TED Talk. And so have you actually put a time limit on when you want to do this TED Talk? <laughs> you know what? I've been telling myself this like since 2019. I was like, yeah, 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 I'm going to give it. I'm going to give it within five years. It's been five years and I still haven't done it. But I still, <laughs> like I always try to manifest it as much as I can. I'm putting it out there in the universe so that eventually I'm going to give this TED Talk. And now I give myself like another deadline, which is before I reach 35, which is in two years. <laughs> okay. And so hopefully before I am, I turn 20, 35, I'm going to give um, my TED Talk. And have you started to formulate an idea of what that will be about? Yes, I do have an idea. I'm not mm-hmm. going to reveal it. No, no, no. Have... All good. <laughs> <laughs> I do have an idea and I also started to talk to people that have given TED Talks so that Mm. I can get a little bit of like an idea on how the process works. And I must say, it's not that easy. Okay. It's not not that easy because you have to reach out like the local TED Talk uh, organization, see if you can like deliver some speeches there. But like in Montreal, there are no local TED Talks. So that's, oh. that's what I have been finding a bit challenging. Mm-hmm. I know that there was um, an opportunity to speak at the TED Talk uh, in Victoria, but Victoria is pretty far from, from Montreal. Like I have to catch a flight and then go there. Okay. And also like what are the, like you still have to apply and you have to be chosen among other speakers. So even then, like I feel like there's a lot of competition. Mm. And I guess on that note, have you competed in the Toastmasters contests to get a bit of practice for that lead up to your TED talk? No, I have not. It is something that I have been thinking about since the beginning of the year. Mm. Um, I never competed in any (laughs) sort of like speech competition, but I am ready for the challenge. Like if there is an opportunity and I have the time, I'm actually like thinking of like competing. I think it's always nice to put like, you know, 
small goals uh, for ourselves to see if we're capable of doing something, but also just for the fun of it. I think it's it's mm. so much fun when you're competing. I think you are also learning a, lot about, a little bit about yourself, what you're capable of, if you're capable of competing. So it's it's really nice to put like little goals or objectives uh, within the bigger objective. Definitely. And I think there's, as some of my guests have talked about, and in fact, last week's guest just came back from speaking at the World Championship of Public mm-hmm. Speaking, one of one of my club members, Colin Williams. And yeah, just hearing about his whole contest journey over 10 years and, and he got to Anaheim this year. And he talked about the amount of work that he puts into speeches and crafting them and just a phenomenal amount of work, but a phenomenal amount of growth and learning comes from every contest journey from what, you know, from what I've heard and from my own experience. So it sounds like a great challenge for you for this year. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, well, all the best if you decide to compete, because I know it's contest season for us. I'm gathering it's similar for you in Montreal. You mentioned a couple of the skills that you've learned during your Toastmasters experience so far, but can you perhaps talk about the most valuable skills that you're seeing come out for you now? I would say there are there are three skills that I have learned from Toastmasters, one of them being leadership skills. And I can see how I have willingness to take initiatives. I can see how it's important to motivate people when you're a leader. I can see how it's important to encourage your your members to, you know, continue giving speeches. And that's one thing that I have learned a lot from like Toastmasters, like the leadership skills. The second skill that I have learned is the critical thinking skills, which I have learned by giving basically feedback and evaluations. Mm -hmm. And it gives me also like, you know, a way to think truly and analyze people when they're giving speeches. And so that has been really nice because I feel like I'm able to observe and notice like things where people have to improve. And then the third skill is the impromptu speeches, especially because I you know, I have a YouTube channel and also because I go to um, interviews, uh, podcast interviews, I feel like I've been able to master a little bit better impromptu speeches. And I learned that, you know, you don't have to always say the truth as long as you can come up with a nice speech and you can deliver it in a nice way. That's all that matters. So these are the three, three things that I have learned the most. Yeah, it's interesting, your take on table topics and the impromptu speaking. One of the members in one of my clubs says, if you don't know, just lie, make something up. We won't know any differently. (laughs) And and every time he talks now, we're sort of all sitting there going, is that true? Because some of his stories are quite colourful and we're like, that probably happened or maybe it didn't. So, (laughs) Um, Yeah. yeah, yeah. And I think also if you say something confidently, people don't tend to question it as much as if you're stuttering and stammering your way through a response. If you say it confidently, people will just, okay, okay, that's that's how it is. Yeah, no, exactly, exactly. Like, you know, there is an expression that says fake it until you make it. Yes. <laughs> that's, that's what I tell everyone. Just no one needs to know that it's it's a lie, you know. And if you say it in a confident manner, no one will know that it was a lie. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Now, you've mentioned your YouTube channel. Tell me a bit about that. Did it come from your Toastmasters experience or just what got you into creating a YouTube channel? Basically, it all started with a friend who has invited me on her YouTube channel. So she invited me in four years ago to go on her YouTube channel for an interview. And then further to that, there was a second person who invited, who has invited me on his channel. Mm. And this is what triggered my interest in creating my own channel. I, because I realized how much I enjoy being like in front of a camera. I enjoyed how much I actually liked connecting with people, uh, how much I liked talking to people and that's what got me to create my youtube channel and i also saw this an opportunity of um to be able to use my uh, my skills that i learned at toastmaster like for example the the table topic session you know a lot a lot of the times i do a lot of interviews and i'm like asking questions i have to use my active listening skills you know and so i thought this is an opportunity to learn but also to be able to apply everything that i have uh, i have learned at toastmaster so that's what got me to create my YouTube channel. I very much enjoy it. I can see how the table topic session comes into play Mm. uh, because you really have to pay attention to what the person is saying. You have to, you know, 
give sh short responses whenever they're responding back. And so that has been really, really helpful. Definitely. And so you on your channel combine your professional focus, which is the you know finance and accounting and but I also see videos on there. you you're a polyglot. You speak what English and French amongst other languages. And you also talk about Toastmasters on there. So it's a really interesting mix of subjects. Does that make it easier to keep going with creating content? Because you've got, you know, a nice broad mix of topics you can talk about. Yeah, this is why I, I created that channel because I wanted to use a sort of like a platform to express myself, but also to talk about my passions. Mm. And so I do talk about like, uh, you know, provide tips on how to pass, you know, certain financial exams. I do talk about Toastmaster because it's a big part of my life. I also talk about, you know, leadership. I talk about language learning and I use this as a way to really express my, uh, my passions. Like I want people to know what I do in my life and we're in a country where, you know, we can do everything we want. Mm -hmm. And so that's how I was like, you know what, it's free. Why not? Let me just try it. So that's how I use it. And you learn so much when you do it. And I only do audio, you do video. That's a whole new level of, you know, just, I mean, it's a similar process, but there's more moving parts. And I just find that you learn so much. And when you have to, typically you're teaching yourself, you're working out how to create and edit things and, you know, just and interview people. And there's so many practical skills that can be applied to real world situations yeah. just by doing this in your own spare time. Yeah, exactly. There is a pre-preparation and then <laughs> there is a post sort of preparation, I guess, because, you know, you have to contact the, the guests, you have to know a little bit the guests, you have to do a little bit of research, you have to provide them with the link to record, you have to let them know how, sh like, uh, the questions, the topic, <laughs> you have to ask for the social media accounts, and then afterwards, there's this whole editing part, which is a lot of work if you think about it when it comes mm. to like video editing it's a lot of work so I'm also learning how to do some video editing which is something that I have I had zero clue about and I had to watch a lot of YouTube videos to <laughs> learn a little bit about editing and it's still a learning process you know but it's still I'm like, I'm like I started to work towards that and I feel like it's also again you know it's, a, it's another added skills that I'm working on and then of course there is this whole like coming up with the caption coming up you know with the description with the title you want to make sure that it's captivating you want to make sure that it's catchy that it goes well with the youtube algorithm it's a lot of work but mm. it pays off it pays off yeah and in ways that you can never necessarily predict i mean even just the nature of the people that you chat with and, and the information that they share and how you can learn from, you know, every guest, I learn something from every guest, but I think it also gives you an excuse to contact people that you otherwise never would, um, you know, whether it's people that have bigger channels or uh, are experts in an industry. I think when you do have a platform there and, that you know, they can see that you're active on it and regularly creating content that, um, yeah, my cat's just walking across the desk here. <laughs> yeah, I, I just think it opens up all sorts of opportunities. And it's, uh, I think in one of your videos, I heard you talking about personal branding. And could you perhaps talk about the importance of personal branding in, in today's world? Yeah, I do think personal branding is super, super, super important. I think it's the most crucial thing that one person can have. And I do talk about like I do a lot of personal branding and for me, it's very important because I work in the corporate job and I often think that I don't want to be associated just with my corporate job. You know, I just don't want to be associated with my company. Like there is me and then there is me working for the company. Mm. And so I always think about, you know, if I'm ever, let's say, let go, if I ever have to quit or I have to change job and people are Googling me, I want them to see me for who I am and what I'm what I'm able to offer. You know, I want them to see my interest, my passion, my personality. And often you see that when you do these things that are outside of your, uh, you know, day-to-day -day job. Because I feel like a lot of people don't do a lot of personal branding. You know, they just work for a certain company. And then, you know, when they quit, it's it's Urmi Hossein who was working for this company, but it's not Urmi Hossein, you know? So for mm. me, it's important to stand out. I think personal branding, uh, it's something that you will always carry. 
it's always going to be with you. I think everyone has personal branding. It's just that it's a matter of cultivating it and working towards it, you know, and there are different ways that you can do it. Like you can do it by writing an article on LinkedIn. You can write an article for an organization. You can do a YouTube interview. You can do a podcast interview. There's so many ways out there. I think it just shows a little bit about personality, which I think a lot of employers always look for. I think when you can point to a body of work and say, yeah, that's what I do in my spare time when, you know, I'm not getting paid to do that. It's something I do regardless of who I work for and how busy I am. I still find time to do that and I do it consistently. And I think even that is such a, an advantage, you know, if you've got two job candidates and fairly similar on a skill set and one's out there pushing out content each week and has been for years it just shows a level of determination and commitment and persistence and (laughs) um, I think it's really important and I think so many Toastmasters could actually take more advantage of these platforms. Especially because they're part of Toastmasters like I feel like there are a lot of people part of Toastmasters but not enough people so I feel like if you are able to use Toastmaster as, as a way to promote yourself, to show that I am working on myself. I do, I am a big proponent of personal development and public speaking as an important thing. I think you can market yourself pretty well. And I, and I think every Toastmaster has the skill of being able to speak. So why not use it? And like Warren Buffett said, like public speaking is probably one of the most valuable uh, skill out there. Like, let's just use it. So I feel like a lot of people can benefit a lot with everything that they learn at Toastmasters. And I think you know, you can create your own YouTube channel, you can create short videos, short reels, you can create Instagram lives, uh, you can go to podcast interviews. And in, in no matter what way you're able to use that skill that you use at Toastmaster, I think you can brand yourself very, very easily. Mm, definitely. Also, it just gives you experience with, well, with interviewing, which is a technique that requires public speaking and active listening, active listening, as you mentioned. But also, like if you do solo episodes, that's effectively creating, you know, whether it's a 20-minute presentation or a 40-minute or however long it goes for, then the guest interviews are quite a different vibe and process as well. So you don't necessarily get all that time in clubs to practice as often as you do when you're creating this content. So do you think, again, this is accelerating your own personal growth beyond Toastmasters? I think it helps. Like, I, you know, when you're creating a speech, yes, you're creating a speech and you have to create it within like a certain time frame. You know, it has to be a certain length. You have to follow a certain objective. And then I find myself when I have to create a YouTube content that I'm like repeating the video. I don't know how many times because I want to make sure that it comes across really nice. And this is where, like, I feel like I'm helping myself by doing that. Like, I'm, I'm like, working on my, like, being able to speak eloquently. Uh, and the same thing, like, I get approached by people to create, like, short videos to promote stuff. And again, like, I feel like, yes, I've been learning, I've been going to Toastmaster, but when it comes to creating content or videos, you still have to practice a little bit. So I feel like I'm helping myself. I'm working towards, like, mastering this this skill and I do think that doing these extra things outside of those masters give me a little bit of like um, advantage compared to other people I think I, I feel a bit more confident and comfortable doing these things uh, mm. so it, it does help yeah yeah and I mean as you mentioned doing interviews is just like doing a series of table topics for each person you know it's the listening and the responding and the <laughs> yeah um, yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, but it's it's live and in action. And, you know, I've got friends in Toastmasters who have said we don't join Toastmasters to go and present in front of other Toastmasters. It's about getting our messages out into the world through whatever means. And if that's the online route, then so be it. Do you do much speaking outside of Toastmasters on stages, you know, actually in, in rooms? And how's that been for you? So in stages it has not happened because I feel like now – with everything being very much hybrid or virtual, people uh, reach out to me for virtual stuff. So for mm-hmm. virtual stuff, I did have a lot of opportunities and I did go forward with those opportunities uh, because I, like I was, for instance, a moderator for um, for an organization and they wanted me to interview people. And so I did that. They actually reached out to me because they saw my YouTube video mm. videos. 
And then there was another organization where I was on the other side being interviewed. So I was part of a panel discussion and I was part of one of the panelists. I didn't know what the questions were going to be. And so I was on the other side, which was nice. I also did some uh, workshop. That was also very nice. They contacted me. It was actually for one of the Toastmasters training. They like uh, basically were looking for people to deliver a workshop. And I was like, why not? Let me just try one. And I (laughs) proposed the topic of like mentorship. And Mm. I did that. And and now what I'm doing is actually I'm reaching out organization to see if I can do some on-site event. I want to give like in-person speeches Mm. uh, because I feel like um, because of like you know the whole pandemic and everything a lot of things went virtual and I feel like I'm I'm not having the opportunity to speak in person so I want to challenge myself by actually Mm. doing uh, in-person speaking engagements I'm also reaching out and looking for those opportunities because I feel like when it comes to virtual I've done a lot and I do very much enjoy doing them but Mm. I want to do something that is a bit more like extra now I want to go a little bit above and is your current Toastmasters club online or do you meet in person? It's online. Oh, okay. Right, right. So you're not getting that that regular dose of speaking in front of people. I gotcha. Yeah. yeah. And I mean, the online clubs are great because they provide flexibility when you're really busy and it's it's great that there is the options of online, hybrid and in person, but yeah, I think there is a little bit of a difference when you've got 20 people in the room eyeballing you and and you, I feel it sort of through my body differently. The adrenaline is actually <laughs> quite palpable when you're standing in a room, which is I like I like <laughs> it. But I think it's important to be able to do both, you know, yes. to be able, as you say, so much is happening online and to have those skills is important as well. Yeah. Yes, yeah. I definitely agree with you. And that's why I think, you know, when you get on stage, it's different than getting in a virtual stage, like real life stages, you feel it in your body, you know, you're like, you see, <laughs> you have people staring at you, you're nervous, you're shaking, you're trembling, mm. whatever, any sorts of, <laughs> any sorts of thing <laughs> is happening in your body. And, and, but I do think that you get a lot from in person, in, like speaking engagement. Like, yes, you're nervous, but I think once you're done speaking, you feel much more confident. At least that's how I used to feel mm. when we would meet in person before the the pandemic. So mm. I I highly recommend that if anyone wants to join a those master's club, just join an in person uh, club. That yeah. club that meets in person. Yeah. Yeah, I always recommend that as a first stop, and it's really interesting because. It's only in doing that that you recognize the physiological things that happen, like the experience of actually getting up in front of a people in a room, even when they're very supportive people, like your body can start to do things that you may have no control (laughs) over, like, as you said, the shaking or the little ticks or whatever happens to happen. And until you do that, you don't, I don't experience that when I speak online. I just don't have any of those physiological symptoms, but sometimes when I'm on in front of an audience yeah you definitely feel it yeah. so <laughs> yes. yeah and I guess it's just understanding and the more you do that the more you then learn how to control those whatever's going on physiologically with your body <laughs> and you sort of touched on it but what would you say to people out there who are thinking about Toastmasters but keep putting it off procrastinating what would you say to them Definitely. If you're looking for a Toastmasters club, I would definitely compare it like going to shopping or not. Actually, it's not like shopping. It's more like dating yeah. because you have to try different clubs until you find the right fit. Mm. And uh, some clubs are a little, little bit more experienced. You have, you know, experienced members who, from who you can learn a lot, but you also need to find your right fit. I think Toastmasters it's probably not for everyone because, you know, some people prefer more like a one-to-one type of uh, coaching and then other people prefer in-person, uh, not in-person, like group setting. Mm. And I think you have to find the right fit because, you know, sometimes in group setting, not everyone have the, has the chance to speak or maybe it doesn't work with the schedule. And so you have to like literally go around and find the one that it's like good for you, good for with your schedule. Are you comfortable, you know, being in a group set, setting or do you prefer having like one-to-one uh, per, like uh, coaching sessions? Definitely that would be my first advice and the second is to just do it you know like 
I know this is what uh, Nike uses, but <laughs> literally just do it. Mm. Uh, you're not losing anything. And the beautiful thing about Toastmasters is that you can go as a guest and you can go for free. So you don't have to pay anything if you just want to attend and see how it is. You can test a little bit the waters by seeing how you speak for the first time when you go because they ask you to introduce yourself. Mm. And so I definitely would say just, just do it. Just go with it and just commit to it. Because I think a lot of people, they don't commit. Mm. Uh, but it's important to stay committed until the end. So always go back to your why go back to why did you decide to go to Ethos Master Club in the first place? So always remind yourself about your why. Definitely. And I think as well, some people can get into the trap of comparing themselves with some of the more experienced Toastmasters. I was having a chat with a relatively new, new Toastmaster the other day who was saying, oh, you know, this person's icebreaker speech was amazing and they used no notes and they were so articulate. And I'm like, well, yes, but this is an advanced club. This person is doing an icebreaker speech but has done one previously and has done probably 15 speeches. So what you're seeing is is not actually a typical icebreaker speech. It's someone's, it's like comparing yourself, what do they say, to someone's highlight reel when you're not mm. really seeing everything that has gone on beforehand. So I think that's the other point It's is don't compare yourself to anyone you see speaking in a Toastmasters club, we're all at different stages and Toastmasters will meet you where you're at. But mm -hmm. it it's more about how you can improve each time you speak. That's the only competition here. <laughs> yeah, I agree. And I do think though, when you see a very good speech, it gives you like sort of like a motivation to also work on yourself. Because I mm. remember... When I first joined Toastmasters and I would see people giving speeches, you know, being able to give feedback, I was mesmerized. I was like, this is what I want to turn into. Mm -hmm. So for me, it was sort of like a motivational tool, you know, like for me, I saw this like very motivating to see that people actually are able to improve. So I saw this as an opportunity to, you know, I have to stick to this if I want to turn like these people. And that's what I did. Mm -hmm. I learned a lot from from a lot of the members that I, I worked with, a lot of them were seasoned uh, speakers and a lot of them were also distinguished Toastmasters. So I actually learned a lot just by observing and mm. and seeing how they were delivering speeches or giving, you know, evaluations, uh, answering impromptu uh, speeches. And there's a lot to be said, as you say, for just being in the room, even if you're not speaking, you're observing, you're practicing your listening skills and you're hearing, even if someone else is delivering an evaluation of someone else's speech, there's always nuggets in there that you can apply and you think, oh, that's a good tip. I'll try that next time. So it's that learning by osmosis and being just being in the room with all of those people who are committed to improving. It's just, it's a powerful environment, right? Yeah, yeah, definitely. It's a powerful environment. Yes. I don't think people realize that as much when they go for their first couple of times because they're so nervous and, you know, deer in the headlights wondering what's going to happen and what the meeting's going to be about. But yeah, I think when you can look back over a year or two or three or four and go, wow, I really have learned a lot just by being there, let alone the direct experience that I've had. So yeah, it's an interesting environment. Now, what would you say are your goals for the year, your Toastmasters goals for this year? So I am in um, level five of the dynamic leadership uh, mm. pathway. So I'm very much looking forward to finish that. Yep. <laughs> and I have a second pathway, which I forgot the name of it. I think, yeah, I forgot the name of it, but it's uh, basically the second pathway. It's when we got it for free during the pandemic. I don't know if you remember. And so I'm looking forward to basically do the second uh, pathway as well. Yeah. And when it comes to being a member of Toastmaster, I do see this more like a long-term commitment. Like I don't see myself stop being part of it, especially because I've seen other members, past members, or who are in my previous uh, club, mm -hmm. they've been at Toastmaster for the past 20 years and they're still <laughs> giving speeches and they see this as a way to basically improving themselves on a daily basis. I actually see myself being there for a very, 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 very long time. Mm, absolutely. And I don't know what it is about, because I've had been in and out of Toastmasters for 
many years and I and I literally say in and out and this current stint I don't know what it was about at this time but this is my I'm committed stint I'm not leaving this is <laughs> and I don't I don't know why maybe it's just I've got more time now I'm I'm not moving location as much as you know I used to and think as well when you're in clubs that have some of those very long-term members, you know, the 30-year or 40-year members that have been, it, yeah. it's been such a part of their life for a long time and you can see where they're at. And it's, okay, all right, <laughs> that's where I want to be and I know I have to keep doing the work to get there. And I heard you in one of your recent interviews and you are saying that public speaking is like a muscle and you basically have to keep. Uh, you're practicing yes. yeah working on it yeah <laughs> yeah 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 because yeah. as soon as you stop you become rusting trust mm, me you definitely you have, to, you have to work on it on a daily basis yes and it's one of the reasons I came back to Toastmasters three and a half years ago because I was doing Facebook lives for an online business that I had and I was watching myself back on some of those and okay time to go back to Toastmasters <laughs> All right. So finishing your level five or finishing your pathway. And what's the final project? If you, you must be working on one of the bigger projects or longer um, speeches. What? <laughs> yeah, I think it's, if I'm not mistaken, it's like an overview of your experience at Toastmaster, something along those lines. Like, or what mm. did you learn? It's a long speech. Yes, it's a long speech. It's something along those lines, but I don't want to expand too much on it because I'm also not 100% sure what it's called the speech itself yeah, yeah yeah actually one of our members just did that on Wednesday night and yeah it's just it's interesting to hear people's reflection on where they've been as well because it, it yeah. for those speeches force you to think about well what actually has all this meant to me and what difference has it made and and what can I impart to other people to inspire them and I think some of those higher level speeches, the level four and the level five projects really do challenge you mm. beyond the five to seven minutes for sure. Yeah, definitely. Do you like the longer speeches or do you like the five to seven minutes? What's your take on that? Yeah, that's a tough question. I actually, I'm not so sure if I, which one I prefer because <laughs> some <laughs> days I do find it really difficult to give a speech between five to seven minutes. I find <laughs> it really tough. Like I'm like, I need to say more. And then I see myself like cutting a lot. Mm. So I probably would say that I think I prefer longer speeches, especially because even when I create my YouTube content, I always see myself like talking for like a good 10 minutes <laughs> easily. <laughs> yeah. And I wonder if doing the YouTube channel as I do the podcasts, if that is actually making the five to seven minute speeches harder because we're used to having almost no, no time limit. <laughs> Oh my gosh. Honestly, I can see why the time and role is so important. <laughs> I can yeah. see why it's so important. Otherwise, I think no one would stop talking. I can see why we need it. Like I see mm. why the time and role is really important in every sense. Like I even when I go to meetings, even when I go to when I do these things, like it's very important to be within the, the time frame. Mm. Yeah. It's important for life and all sorts of situations. So I, yeah. it is a good discipline, but it's still hard. I always talk long. If I'm going to talk, it's not ever going to be under the time limit. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <so. laughs> uh, and is there anything else that you'd like to share before we wrap up? So I do have a quotation, <laughs> uh, which I very much like to live by. And it says, everything you ever wanted is sitting on the other side of here. And it's a mm. quotation by George Adair, hopefully I'm pronouncing this correctly. And basically mm. what the quotation is saying that if you ever want to achieve something in life, um, you must conquer your fear. Mm. And I do, like we know, public speaking, it's probably one of the most, you know, common fear among many people. But if you ever want to, you know, become a better speaker, you have to conquer this fear. So I do like very much this quotation. And that's my message for your audience out there, for your listeners. Awesome. Well, Great piece of advice. And as you said earlier, just do it if you're thinking about wanting to get into a Toastmasters club or just even starting. So Ermi, I've really enjoyed speaking with you today and thanks so much for reaching out. It's always lovely when other Toastmasters reach out through the wonders of social media. And I love that the community 
is like that. And normally you get the best reception and it's like, yes, cool, let's chat, you know. <laughs> so I wish you the best with the preparation for your TED Talk and potential contests this year. And and <laughs> I look forward to uh, seeing the footage of, of you on the TED stage. Thank you. <laughs> All the best with everything. If you're ready to unlock your potential, consider joining a Toastmasters club near you. Check out the Find a Club link on the Toastmasters International website at www.toastmasters.org. It's worth visiting a couple of different clubs as a guest to see which club best suits you. If you do take the leap and visit a meeting, I would absolutely love to hear your experience. Feel free to message me at talkativetoastmaster at gmail.com or tag me in the comments if you found this podcast on YouTube, Facebook, Instagram or Twitter. Thanks for listening to today's show. Head to talkativetoastmaster.com where you'll find the show notes for this and all other episodes, as well as links to some awesome Toastmasters resources. If you found value in today's content, I'd really appreciate if you could share it with friends and colleagues who may be interested, or leave a review on iTunes. This helps more people to find us. Until next time, remember the words of Roger Love. All speaking is public speaking, whether it's to one person or a thousand. Have a great week.